Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Shantae Stewart, Vice President and Head of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion here at Evoke Kind. And today I have a very special guest joining me, Lauren Wesley Wilson, founder and CEO of Colorcom Incorporated. For those who don't know, Colorcom is the nation's leading women's platform addressing diversity and inclusion across a multitude of industries, including communications, marketing, advertising, and media, and serves more than 40,000 professionals, some of which are EvokeCon employees. <laughs> but not only is Lauren the founder and CEO of Colorcom, she is an award-winning businesswoman, marketer, media spokesperson, and diversity and inclusion strategist, and one of the nation's leading thought leaders on DNI, crisis comms, and media relations. So thank you so much for joining us today, Lauren. We're so thrilled to have you here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so glad to be here. Thank you. Of course, of course. Well, you know, as we're on the heels of Black History Month, and now we're recognizing Women's History Month and International Women's Day, there's really no better time than, than now, really, for us to have this discussion about diversity, equity, and inclusion across the industry. And more importantly, equity for women in the workplace, uh, more, you know, especially for women of color. Um, but before we dive into our chat, we'd really like to kick things off by asking you just a few personal questions uh, so that the audience can get to know you a little bit better before we dive in officially. How does that sound? Sounds good to me. Hope they're not gotcha questions. <laughs> they won't be. They won't. I promise. All right. Um, well, tell us your story in six words. Um, this can be any six words that come to mind when it comes to you and your journey. Um, and then we'll have you explain a couple of those words and why you decided to choose them. Okay. I hope I can come up with six, <laughs> <laughs> but I'll start with fearless, focused, yeah. ambitious, ambitious, family oriented. That's kind of a word and a half. <laughs> um, <laughs> gosh, I would say uh, funny because you have to have a sense of humor. Absolutely. Um, is that six? That might have been six. I think it was five or six, but we're going to go with that. And I think that that's good enough. Um, I, I like the word fearless because I think that it's a word that people feel like they can't do anything without, like they, they can only do it unless they're fearless. fearless. Um, you know, what does that mean to you being fearless uh, as a woman of color in, in leadership? You know, I would, I would say that I was a lot more fearless when I was a little bit younger yeah. Um, about 10 years ago, color comes going on 10 years. And I know when I first yeah. started, I almost had no fear. I really just was focused on starting this organization, getting the job done. I had all these things in my head, what needed to get done for mm -hmm. it to be executed and look like X, Y, and Z. No one knew me. I had no network. I had, uh, nothing. I was starting from scratch. So there was no attention on me. No one was trying to figure out who I am. Um, I wasn't hobnobbing, quote unquote, I wasn't in the rooms necessarily. I was just getting started. So right. you, when you want to get started and you have a goal and you have a vision, it was all about, let's get to that end. Cause you can see in your head what the end of the tunnel and what the end of the road looks like. And it's all mm -hmm. about the end of the road, you know, no matter what. So that's kind of how this journey started. You had to be fearless. I had to be fearless and I had to not worry about, um, what other people thought about me or what people were saying, or was I old enough or was I more experienced enough? I mean, I just kind of had to do it. So that's, um, you know, why I chose that word. I, I love that, Lauren. And I, I think I want to take that advice <laughs> myself as I move forward um, in my career as well. Many times the focus is on diversity and inclusion. Could you talk a little bit about why equity is so important uh, in the DNI conversation? Sure. I mean, equity is about having a stake. It's about having power. It's about having ownership. And so equity comes down to if you are overseeing DNI initiatives, it's really important to not just have conversations about we need our leadership to be more diverse or we need more diversity here. It's really important that you have some math and some metrics in place so mm -hmm. that you all know that what, what are we trying to achieve? What are our goals? What are we working towards? What is our also our budget? because you really cannot make changes without money, without dollars. <laughs> right. A lot of people want to make change for free. They kind of want to do it on the, on the cheap. I hear human resources all the time talk about, well, we just need to hire fast and we need to hire more people of color. And we really just want you to send some resumes over or why can it be that easy? You know, I go mm -hmm. to 
Bob and he can provide me 10 white guys. Why can't I go to, you know, Judy and she can't do the same, or I want right. to be able to have, you know, all these things for free at your fingertips. So, you know, DNI, it's like any other business unit. It needs a budget, it needs a plan, it, there needs to be metrics in, at place. And then that person who's overseeing inclusion needs to be able to report to the CEO. That's equity, having power, having a budget, having autonomy, having inclusivity among the decision makers and, mm -hmm. and power brokers within that company. Because if you're just off to your own la la land with no budget, <laughs> no power, no team, then how are you really making change? And then each year after year, we find ourselves in the same position. And it's because we didn't view it as its own business unit. DNI is not just about uh, internal measures. It's also about external measures. Exactly. So what are we doing as it relates to our clients? Are we representing our clients in the best way in, 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 as it relates to the teams that we put together, as it relates to the campaigns and the messaging, not just making sure we have people of color to win the business, whether are they actually working on the business? That's really, really, really important. So we don't find ourselves in, in crisis that we ultimately put ourselves in because we didn't plan accordingly and we didn't have diverse people as a part of that team. What does allyship mean to you? And what are some examples that you've seen of white colleagues showing up and speaking up for colleagues of color in a, in a substantial way? No, allyship, quite frankly, means using your white privilege to open doors for those who can't have those doors opened. And it is about understanding your power and using it to advance those who are marginalized. And so, you know, when you work in big organizations, the primary race is white, the primary race of leadership, of CEOs, of executives, of C-suite is white. And so if you need things to get done, it, you need to work together, you need to be able to collaborate and you need allies to help open the door that have already have established trust among leadership to push your idea or initiative forward. It's also about thinking, it's about really being perceptive and really having it on top of mind. If you go into a meeting and you, if you notice that there's only one person of color in the meeting, maybe think about another person of color. It's not enough because if, if the things were, the, if the things were opposite, if you walked into a group and they're all black people or all Latinx or all Asian people mm -hmm. and you were white, you'd look around and you'd wonder where's somebody else who looks like me. Right. Just because you're the minority race, it is thinking about how can you make sure that other people have a seat at the table that are a part of conversations. And it really takes that. I know when I was working in agency world and um, first of all, a little bit of background about me, I grew up in an all white environment. So to what does that mean? It means that I went to a school that was predominantly white. I went to a private school in St. Louis, Missouri, uh, one of the best private schools in the state of Missouri. I went to, my neighborhood was all white. My neighbors used to chase me around with hockey sticks saying <laughs> the N word. It was really- oh, no. Yeah, no, it was trash. But you know, that's that was that was what I grew up with. So I, I went to an had an all white background, um, and I went to an all black school. I went to Spelman, and so my background was night and day. And so there was always this sense of you know belonging and otherness, which I really understand and how I feel. But I bring up my background to say that because I grew up in all white environments. And when I first had my first job, it was an all white conservative Republican um, company that I worked for. It took those people, my peers, my friends to open doors for me. It mm -hmm. took them to say, how about we're all going to the hockey game? Do you want to come with us after work? I, first of all, don't like hockey, but it's the invite that matters. It's not about right. whether or not I like the sport. Well, actually I do like, you know, it's, right. it's not about whether or not I like the sport. It's about whether or not I'm being included to get to know my colleagues. And it took someone who didn't look like me to open that door because I was already not invited. I didn't already know about it. There were these mm -hmm. gatherings and secret meetings that are happening before the meeting that I didn't know about and that I got invited to. So that's the type of examples of allyship and thinking about how you can open the door for someone else and how, frankly, you can include, whether it's a small way or a big way, 
if you're not in those rooms, if you're not in those meetings, if you don't have those opportunities to get to know your colleagues, if you don't even know that there's a gathering going on, how do you think you could advance at work? You can't. So, I mean, that's important. And now that we're in a virtual environment, you know, just thinking about people other than yourself, who should be on this call, right. who should add value, who should be at this meeting, who should be at this virtual happy hour that we're doing. Just thinking about that is also allyship. Yes, that's that's super important, creating that sense of inclusion. And like you said, belonging, that's that's very important. And using your privilege, like you said, to speak up uh, for your colleagues of color. We know in PR and comms, there's a lack of diversity, uh, especially the higher up the chain you go. Uh, you know, what are some ways organizations can go about diversifying their leadership to include people of color, but specifically women of color for these more tenured positions? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of things. I mean, one, we have to get rid of the notion of needing agency experience. I know right. that agencies always say we're looking for someone with agency experience because they understand how to work with our clients and it's a client driven business. I completely get that. But if people of color are having a hard time getting in the door to begin with, where is that agency experience going to come with, come from? There's other experiences that are very valuable and honestly, you can teach client service, you can teach that. What you can't, you know, at this stage, what's hard to learn is if you're a good writer, because you should have those, those are skills that needed to be established throughout your, your career. So being a good writer, being a good media pitcher, handling other organizations and groups, being in high pressure environment and situations, oftentimes you build really good talent for agencies. So I think that's really important. Also, I always say sometimes it really does start at the bottom and how we structure our internship pools. That's oftentimes the entryway. That's oftentimes when you look at people who've been at those companies for 10, 15 years, they mm -hmm. started as an intern or they started as a junior level employee. And those salaries are, very, internships pay nothing. And not only do they not pay anything, but they set itself, they, those pools at those companies set themselves up to hire a certain socioeconomic, socioeconomic person, someone with high status. So basically mm -hmm. to get in the door, if you're working at one of these big agencies, you're, you're getting paid, you know, maybe $15 an hour, if that, mm -hmm. and if you, and if you're if a, a college degree is required plus $15 an hour, that weeds out people of color who can't necessarily, oftentimes, not all people of color, but oftentimes right. can't can't support that and don't have their parents to fund them. Because I look at a lot of these companies with these young, amazing rock star interns who are wearing labeled shoes and labeled bags mm -hmm. and they're being supported by their parents who can, who, who have money, who can frankly afford for them to work at a company that pays you $15 an hour. So really valuing your internship pool, thinking about paying them a little bit more so that you have a diverse group um, also making sure that you partner on with other organizations. Maybe some organizations can, can supplement that, um, that fee. I know there, there's a lot out there. So thinking about that in that way. Um, I know we do a fellows program that allows for s some of that and gets you great talent. So it's something to think about. But um, to answer your question, I think there's a variety of things that can help you uh, diversify your leadership um, as it relates to the experience you're looking for, as it relates to how you go about finding diverse talent. It don't think that finding diverse talent is gonna be the same way that you find everybody else. You have to right. also make sure your human resources team and the person scouting the talent is diverse as well. Cause mm -hmm. how do you find diverse people if you don't have diverse people on your team? It's a challenge, it doesn't come naturally to think about the organizations and groups. I know for me, I'm on a lot of listservs, listservs. I'm on a lot of poli women of color in politics and political listservs and there's communications listservs and I'm on a lot of them. A lot of HR at these, at these companies have no idea how to get involved in these listservs and only if they knew or they had people to guide them, they could be promoting their jobs through those listservs. Right. It's nothing but talent because I can, I can point to somebody, a person of color, and they can say, well, I got 20 friends for you right now, <laughs> you, you know, but you point to exactly. somebody else, you might say, I'm having challenges. So it's making sure your recruiting team is diverse too. Well, thank you so much, Lauren. Like, I mean, you've shared so many great gems and pieces of advice today with us. 
Uh, thank you so much for taking the time for, to chat with me uh, about DE&I across the industry. You know, I've heard you say, you know, we need to have metrics in place. There needs to be a budget. <laughs> uh, you know, when it comes to allyship, just making sure you're using your privilege and being authentic in your interactions, uh, finding different and creative ways uh, to, to get diverse talent and partners. Um, so we thank you again for, like I said, sharing the stage with me today. Um, for those who would like to learn a little bit more about ColorCom, you can visit colorcomnetwork.com.